You may have been hearing about something in the news recently, something that's happening more and more. Activism. I say that because we've seen a rise in social movements. Those movements include everything from the I Don't Know More movement to the Occupy movement to the Quebec student movement last summer. We've seen a rise in activism over the last couple of years. But typically when we think of activists, we get images like this. The regular police clashes, you know, riot gear, protesting, and lots and lots of banners. <laughs> you probably don't see yourself a part of this. The world of activism is a distant and far removed one, an inaccessible one for most. But it's time for that to change. For the crises of our world are only going to get worse if we continue to see activism this way. If we continue to see that it's the responsibility of some distant other, some demonized other sometimes, always someone else to tackle our world problems. No, it has to be all of us now. But to do this, we need to redefine what activism means. We need to rewrite a page in our cultural dictionaries of change making to something we ourselves can feel a part of. I like to call this activism 2.0 a new version of activism that's not just for a few, but for all of us to participate in in changing the outcome of our world. Now, I belong to such a movement that needs this rebirth in its activism. As of late, some have called it outdated, ineffective. Fewer and fewer people can identify with my movement, yet it is one that we depend on for our survival, and that's the environmental movement. I was actually born into the environmental movement. From this picture, we look Pretty average, good 80 sideburns and hairdos and all. <laughs> um, but behind it is the fact that my parents were the co-founders of Greenpeace. That's my dad there in the corner with the revolutionary fist. He was the first president of Greenpeace. He led many of the first campaigns of this huge environmental group. My mother there in the corner is the first woman to save a whale by using her body as a human shield blocking a harpoon at sea. Now, my parents and original eco-warriors like them won numerous battles in those days. Victories to save whales, stop nuclear testing, even spark a mainstream environmental movement and shape the public's consciousness around our, about our surrounding environments. But the times have changed, and those tactics aren't quite winning us the same victories, particularly against the juggernaut crises we face today. Now, of course, I didn't know this when I started my own activism at 19 years old. I joined a group that is still winning. It's winning battles for the whales. And that's Sea Shepherd. That's me with Uncle Paul, as I call him, and my family friends. But you probably know him more as the notorious and controversial Captain Paul Watson. And you may have heard of us. We have our own reality TV show called Whale Wars, as everything has a reality TV show these days, it seems. <laughs> but we're that group that goes down to the Antarctic Ocean, volatile seas, chasing whalers, and we will do anything, ramming into boats even, <laughs> taking our high-speed boats and chasing after them, um, blocking boats, even jumping onto other boats that we oppose and be taken hostages for our causes, whatever it takes. And this group has saved thousands of whales' lives doing this. But obviously, this kind of radical activism isn't for everyone. Even seafaring isn't for everybody. And to be honest with you, I wasn't very good at it myself. <laughs> I battled on the high seas all right, but I battled more with my stomach, with seasickness, <laughs> than I did with the whalers. As much as I tried, and I really did, I just wasn't very good at it. I, I spent sometimes half the campaign seasick in bed, or more in the toilet, but <laughs> I mean, but this kind of being in bed and being sick like this, being ill like this, really makes you question a lot of things about yourself. It really made me question whether I have the strength and ability to be this great activist as my parents had been, whether I have it what it takes to be an activist at all, and what did activism mean to me anyways. Now, around this same time, 
when I had all these questions in my mind, um, my life changed dramatically. My father, my hero, and my best friend died of cancer. Now, he was the person I would stay up late at night having great conversations about the world and our dreams for it, and I could no longer have that. There was so much wisdom and so much knowledge that I could no longer learn from. There were so many questions left unanswered. He was the person that was guiding me through my activism, and he was gone. There was a void in my life, and I was left to try to figure out what activism meant anymore. Now, around this same time, it seemed that it was not just the end of my father's legacy, but the end of an era for the environmental movement itself. A controversial report had been released called The Death of Environmentalism by Michael Schellenberger and Ted Nordhaus. They claimed that environmentalism was no longer capable of dealing with the world's most serious ecological crisis. For while the world has profoundly changed economically, socially, technologically, and most importantly, ecologically, environmentalists were using the same tactics and the same assumptions we used since the 1970s. But in the face of climate change, our most serious ecological crisis yet, the same old protesting and the same old playing politics begging and pressuring our government to do the right thing just isn't working. I'm sorry to say, but that's the hard truth. Another hard truth is the fact that we as a human species, not just the activists, we as humans are losing the battle for our planet. As we are entering a new normal of an ecological and climate destabilization. You may not know, but 2012 was a record-breaking year, and not in a good way. They're not going to put this in the Guinness World Records, I can tell you that. But it was one of the top 10 warmest years since record temperature taking began. Half the Arctic ice shield is now gone, and we've seen historic extreme weather events from tornadoes to wildfires to Hurricane Sandy. And frankly, this is just the beginning because we have five times more the safe limit of fossil fuel reserves ready to be spewed into our atmosphere, and globally, there's no regulations in sight to stop this from happening. Now, I don't mean to be such a downer. <laughs> I know this is kind of doom and gloomy. Um, and frankly, it's probably not what people want to hear, or at least we're not being told. According to a media study by Media Matters, climate coverage in this last year, with all this happening, got a total of eight minutes. Eight minutes on the Sunday news channels in the US, not much better here in Canada. Meanwhile, a viral media YouTube sensation got 1.2 billion views. And yes, that's Gangnam Style. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I like the song just as much as anybody. It's hard to beat catchy lyrics like, hey, sexy lady. <laughs> but that's the point. I mean, we're getting engaged with stuff that is funny, that's exciting, things you want to tune into and be a part of. And we need that now for a movement. We need the virality of activism. We need change-making in the billions now if we're going to change the outcome of our future. But to do that, traditional activism needs to be shaken up. <laughs> I mean, it's not the 1960s, it's the 21st century, and we need activism re to reflect that in our society. We have a whole new set of problems, and we need a whole new set of tactics to deal with them. And this is especially true in the environmental movement. For as Philip Shabakov said, if environmentalism is to be an agent of necessary social transformation, it will have to transform itself. Now, he is an environmental historian, and I couldn't agree with him more. But this transformation is happening, and it's happening from an unsuspecting group, young people. Yes, I said it, the dreaded young people, the lazy, apathetic, and my personal favorite, doom generation. I mean, how more pessimistic can you get <laughs> about young people? It's actually a unique generation, because we're a generation that is at a crossroads. Generation Y, the millennial generation, is at the edge of this crossroads that humanity is facing. We either continue on with this destructive path that we know is destructive and quite honestly going to steal our future away, or we start to rebuild towards the future we know is possible. But that's a heavy load to put on any generation. That's pretty scary and pretty big to put on our shoulders. But it can also be exciting. Because while we live in a critical time, this is also a transformative time. And we have the power to transform our world into something better. Now, 
we're, we can make a significant impact, impact as this generation because we're actually the largest generation that's ever existed. There are 3.5 billion of us. That's half the Earth's population that is my generation or younger, under the age of 30. <laughs> this is what the UN is calling us, the new global power reshaping the world. Already, there are rising numbers of young people that are tackling world issues and wanting to reshape our future. Globally, youth contribute more than 2.4 billion hours to voluntary causes each year. And so that doesn't sound so apathetic, does it? <laughs> so that's the point. It's, it's changing the narrative. Now, I've been documenting this trend, particularly in the environmental movement. Over the last 10 years, is I've been discovering my own activism. I've been documenting these stories of other activists. And what I found is such a bigger story that we're not being told. And it's this new generation of change makers emerging from all around the world, all walks of life, creating change in a diversity of ways, using whole new sets of tactics. And I'd like to share with you today a couple of their stories. This is Ola. And now, in this picture, I know it probably seems Usual protest, pretty small protest at that of one person. But there's more that meets the eye. The number she holds here on her banner is 350. That's 350 parts per million. That's the benchmark level of safe carbon emissions in our atmosphere. We're already well past that at 400 parts per million. And so this number becomes a rallying call to reduce our emissions now and take action now, rather than our politicians want to do in 10, 20 years, whenever. <laughs> So this becomes an ambitious message. This is a very ambi ambitious message. And what she was doing was a very brave act. For you see, in this photo, she's actually in her home country of Iraq. It was very risky for her to demonstrate like this. She had to go through several military checkpoints to get to a safe place to do it, and none of her friends would join her. It was just her. But this photo and her bravery went viral across social media. It was seen by hundreds of thousands of people making her message echo that much more. And what she was doing was joining a global day of action, where over 5,000 other events were held in 180 countries where, similar to her, people were holding this message of 350 up to the world. It's what CNN called the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history. They did this in places from Australia, Egypt, underwater to Canada, all over. And how they did it is they used the internet to globally synchronize their day and have more of an impact coming together. And then they echoed their message around the world using social media. You see, young people, we know how to use technology pretty well, but we're beginning to use it as tools for change, making this small, perhaps insignificant action, echoing it into so much more and making a global movement. Now, next, this is Topeka, and she's trying to solve the global water crisis. She's a young scientist who has come up with a solar water purification system. She's using the solar rays to kill off bacteria, bacteria in drinking water. And what this is so great about this is it's not just an environmental issue, but this is a social justice issue, because she's making a low-cost, accessible means to the global south for drinkable water. Now, this is the kind of stuff where young people are not just pointing to problems, but creating the kind of solutions we need. Next is Felix. He's who I call a Tree Hugger 2.0. <laughs> he founded his own organization called Plant for the Planet. And this is a pretty incredible group because it's taking what is a small local action of planting a tree and multiplying it into larger change. What he has done, he made a call out to schools and school children around the world to plant as many trees as they could in their countries. And what happened was these children responded in huge numbers. Already, they've now planted four million trees around the world, four million. And they're aiming to get to a billion by 2020. Now, this isn't just about forest cover for this group. This is about climate change, taking action on climate change themselves. Because trees obviously not just produce oxygen, but suck in carbon emissions and pollution. So while the adults continue to debate, these children and this movement of children are taking action. Now, not all these examples would necessarily call themselves activists or environmentalists, much like yourselves. But this is the point of Activism 2.0, is that it's about redefining change-making to something we ourselves can identify with. It's not about necessarily filling out a stereotype. It's not necessarily about jumping on a boat and ramming into other boats. 
though if you're so inclined, great. <laughs> uh, but it's not about also becoming some great hero or legend in the world. Trust me, I've had to learn that the hard way. But what change making is about today, but finding our own role to play in this critical time. Using our own skill sets, our own talents, our own abilities, even our own paid work to affect change in small and large ways. Whatever we can do. Whether that's using social media to echo messages, whether that's using science to create solutions, or that's building community, either globally or in your neighborhood, to taking a small action and making it larger. Whatever it is, you, you can use your skill sets, your talents, as tools for change. Now for me, I have finally discovered what my change making is. After years of documenting these stories, after years of telling these stories to as many people as possible, to as, in as many ways as possible, from writing, filmmaking, to standing right here right now with you, I realized that my activism is storytelling. Telling stories to reshape what is possible in ourselves and what is possible in our world. And if there's one thing that I've learned as a storyteller, is that we can change the narrative of what we've been told to believe. Our world is not hopeless. Our future is not hopeless. We are not hopeless. If we choose to be our own change makers now, we can change the story of our time to being one of hope. Thank you. <laughs>